This video is sponsored by World of Warships. Thomas Ismay's revitalized White Star Line began with the maiden voyage of the first Oceanic in 1871. The innovative liner would help modernize the North Atlantic passenger trade by placing emphasis on passenger comfort and safety. Over the next several decades, the White Star Line would continue to innovate, building ever larger and more technologically advanced ocean liners. But by the 1920s, an unsteady financial position and a fleet diminished by war, tragedy, and poor decisions left the once great company at a crossroads. It was decided that in order to regain the company's dominance, they would build a revolutionary new 1,000-foot superliner powered entirely by diesel-electric engines. The new liner's name would harken back to the ship that started it all, but the third Oceanic would never be finished. Instead, the last gasps of the White Star Line would be played out by a modest liner constructed one slip away, the MV Britannic, the last liner to sail under the White Star Line flag. Before we get into the fascinating story of the MV Britannic, I want to take a quick moment to talk about this video's sponsor, World of Warships. If you're anything like me, you love any opportunity to immerse yourself in history. World of Warships is a free-to-play game for PC that lets you control more than 400 historical ships from the First and Second World War in stunning lifelike maps. You can choose your favorite class of ship, whether it be destroyers, battleships, cruisers, aircraft carriers, or even submarines. Join more than 44 million players and take part in team-based battles. Develop your strategy as you take on the enemy and the weather itself. The game is also always evolving, with frequent new content and new missions. And, if you love imagining historical what-ifs, you'll love the many blueprints and designs that were never built in the real world but have been given life in the game's virtual dockyards. World of Warships isn't just a game, it's an immersive digital floating museum. Put yourself in the center of the action today by following the link in the description below. Use the code FIRE during registration to get a massive starter pack, including 200 doubloons, 1 million credits, the premium battleship USS Texas, 20 times restless fire camouflage, and 7 days of a premium account. You won't want to miss out on this incredible opportunity to take part in history. Alright, back to the MV Britannic. The First World War took a heavy toll on the White Star Line. At the outset of the conflict, the company controlled 35 vessels, all of which served the war effort in some capacity. By war's end, the company lost 10 ships, including HMHS Britannic, the largest British passenger liner at the time. That left her sister, the RMS Olympic, the line's only surviving modern express liner available to service the critical Southampton to New York route. But the genesis of the company's decline began nearly two decades before. In 1902, the White Star Line was purchased by the International Mercantile Marine Company, or IMM for short. The company was owned by American banker J.P. Morgan, who you may know from your debit card. The company was formed with the intention of monopolizing the North Atlantic shipping trade by consolidating as many lines as possible. The White Star Line, which was under control of J. Bruce Ismay, was initially reluctant to agree to the deal. Ismay knew that his father, Thomas Ismay, who died in 1899, would have vehemently opposed such an arrangement. But Morgan was determined and offered extremely lucrative incentives to White Star Line's shareholders, convincing them to accept the offer. The company was by far the most successful subsidiary of the IMM and rapidly expanded their fleet in the pre-war years, culminating in the Olympic-class trio. But the trust was heavily criticized in both the United States and Britain after the Titanic disaster. J. Bruce Ismay never fully recovered after the tragedy and he stepped away from the White Star Line on June 30, 1913. He was heavily blamed for the disaster, though he was officially cleared of any wrongdoing, and was actually credited with encouraging many reluctant passengers into the lifeboats that night, saving several lives. By the end of the war, it was clear to the IMM that their ambition of monopolizing the North Atlantic was unlikely to succeed, and the American company began looking for ways to unload their British holdings. 
an early attempt by Lord Peary and Owen Phillips, later known as Lord Kilsand, to purchase the company's British properties was blocked at the last minute by President Woodrow Wilson, resulting in a complicated and tense situation that kept the company in limbo through most of the next decade. During this time, the company struggled to replace liners lost in the war and relied on the older Big Four to supplement their most important routes. The RMS Olympic was returned to passenger service in 1920, and other IMM liners were tapped to supplement other routes. In 1922, the company received three German liners that were ceded to the British government as war reparations. These included the SS Bismarck, the largest passenger ship in the world at the time, which was renamed the RMS Majestic, the SS Berlin, which became the Arabic, and the SS Columbus, which became the RMS Homeric. The Majestic and Homeric were placed on the lucrative Southampton to New York route alongside the Olympic. The three liners were popular with passengers as the transatlantic immigration trade picked up in the early 1920s. This was until the United States passed the Immigration Act of 1924, greatly limiting the number of Europeans allowed to migrate to the United States. This had a major effect on all shipping lines, which depended on immigration to fill their liners. The White Star Line quickly shifted their strategy to focus on tourism and began refitting their ships to reflect the change. In 1926, Lord Kilsen, the chairman of Harland & Wolf, made a new bid to purchase the White Star Line from the IMM. This time, he was successful, and his Royal Mail Steam Packet Company took possession of the line on January 1, 1927. The acquisition made the company the largest shipping group in the world, but the move would eventually doom the White Star Line. Lord Kilsen's empire was heavily indebted from the beginning. The White Star Line remained successful, but profits were siphoned away to support other parts of the sprawling shipping empire, creating an unstable web of debt and mismanagement. Through all these changes, it was clear that the White Star Line needed new liners if the company had any chance of staying competitive. A massive new liner was laid down on June 28, 1928. The ambitious project would be the first liner to exceed 1,000 feet, and she would be by far the largest motor vessel ever constructed. Sure to be powerful, luxurious, and attention-grabbing, she would easily beat out the liners planned by Cunard and European rivals. This new liner would be the line's third oceanic. At the same time, a moderately sized motor vessel was also planned to help fill out the White Star Line fleet. Her keel was laid down on April 14, 1927 at Harland & Wolf in Belfast. But despite lofty ambitions, only one of these two ships would ever make it to launch. While the new Oceanic was designed to make a statement, the motor vessel being constructed nearby on slip number one was designed to be economical. Along with her planned sister ship, this new liner would have two propellers, each driven by a five-cylinder, four-stroke, double-acting diesel engine, giving her a planned service speed of 17.5 knots. This speed was far from fast, but the slower crossings allowed for lower tariffs and significantly greater fuel efficiency. The MV Britannic was launched on August 6, 1929. Only a couple of months later, the Wall Street crash of 1929 ushered in the Great Depression. Despite the downturn, construction on the vessel continued. But the Oceanic project, already delayed by changes to her complex propulsion system, was doomed as the downturn brought the financial difficulties of Lord Kilsen's shipping empire to the surface. An appeal was made to the British government for support, but the request was refused and the project was ended for good. Her keel, hull plates, and other parts were repurposed for the Britannic and her sister ship, the MV Georgic, which was laid down in July 1929. Britannic Sea Trials began in May 1930. She came in at 26,943 tons. She was 683.6 feet long with a beam of 82.4 feet. She was designed as a cabin class liner, an informal term for liners that were designed to offer comfort and luxury at affordable rates. Her original configurations could accommodate 504 cabin class passengers, 551 tourist class passengers, and 498 third-class passengers. When completed, she was the largest British motor vessel in service, and the second largest in the world after Italy's MS Augustus. The Britannic was equipped with two short, wide funnels to complement her exterior design, which combined classic styling and modernity. Her forward funnel was false and, ironically enough, 
was used to house smoking rooms for deck and engineering officers. She had a classic knife's edge bow and a modern cruiser stern. While the Britannic was designed to offer crossings at affordable rates, she was appointed with luxurious accommodations that could easily compete with express liners. Her cabin class dining saloon was decorated with Louis XIV style and her other spaces took on similar classic styling, reminiscent of those found on older liners, with only hints of art deco. The movement was rapidly growing in popularity at the time and would heavily influence her sister ship, the Georgic. The MV Britannic sailed her maiden voyage on June 28, 1930. The year would go on to be an absolute disaster for the White Star Line, which recorded its first deficit in its history. In an attempt to remedy the dire situation, many older vessels were sold. Still, the Britannic proved a perfect fit for the difficult financial times she came into service. Passengers loved her. She was modern, attractive, and affordable. By reducing operating costs, the White Star Line was able to offer reduced rates for a crossing that didn't feel cheap. Along with the Georgic, the two liners generated significant profit for the struggling company. The MV Britannic generated considerable public attention during her maiden voyage, with an estimated 14,000 people gathering to see her off in Liverpool. She earned a warm welcome when she arrived in New York, and around 1,500 people paid a dollar each to tour her interiors. Initially, she was operated at a 16-knot service speed, but after her first three voyages, her speed was increased to 17.5 knots on westbound crossings and just over 19 knots on eastbound. Early on, she shared her route with three of the older big four, the Adriatic, the Baltic, and the Cedric. But soon she was joined by her running mate, the MV Georgic. While the Britannic was popular, she averaged only 609 passengers per voyage in her first 15 months of service, amounting to about 40% of her capacity. Like most White Star Liners, her schedule was supplemented with occasional cruises from New York to destinations like the Mediterranean and the West Indies. Despite issues filling her cabin class, Tourist class bookings on her sailings frequently sold out, and on some crossings, cabin class staterooms were used for tourist class passengers to accommodate the high demand. Still, her low operating costs and relative popularity made her by far the most profitable ship in the White Star Line fleet in 1931, and in the years that followed, her popularity grew. By 1933, she was exceeding 1,000 passengers per voyage, amounting to 65% of her capacity. That might not sound impressive, but it was the highest rate of capacity for any transatlantic liner at the time, meaning that the modest Envy Britannic was proving one of the most popular ways to cross the Atlantic. She and the Envy Georgic were a rare bright spot in an industry struggling to survive the Depression. But their success couldn't overcome the damage done by Lord Kilson. As economic conditions worsened, his debts mounted. The situation came to a head in 1931 when he was charged with fraud and imprisoned. His abrupt departure left the ailing company in complete disarray. By that point, the White Star Line's only hope for survival was a bailout from the British government, who reluctantly agreed on one condition. They would have to merge with their longtime rival, the Cunard Line, which was experiencing a dire financial situation of its own. On May 10th, 1934, Thomas Ismay and Samuel Cunard's legacies would combine to create the Cunard White Star Line. The merger would prove the death of the once proud White Star Line, but through it all, the Britannic would carry the company's legacy through the post-war era. Control of the new Cunard White Star Line was determined by the tonnage the two companies brought to the merger which was unfortunate for the White Star Line as they recently sold a number of their ships in an attempt to alleviate their debt. This meant that Cunard held 62% of the new company, effectively taking control. Most of the White Star Line's ships were scrapped, including the RMS Olympic, affectionately known as Old Reliable, and the RMS Majestic, the largest ship ever operated by the company. The only liners that would remain in service were the Laurentic, the Georgic, and of course, the Britannic. The two motor vessels were transferred to the London to New York route in April 1935. As the new company took shape and the decade drew on, the Britannic continued to build in popularity, even with new competition from cabin class liners from the United States and France. By 1938, the Britannic was reaching 75% of her capacity. 
But on August 27th, 1939, with war only a few days away, everything changed for the MV Britannic when she was requisitioned by the British government and converted to a troop ship in Southampton. Her first mission took her to Bombay, where she was fitted with additional armaments. She then returned to England and actually resumed commercial service in 1940, carrying a large number of refugees from Central Europe and children from the United Kingdom to North America. These voyages also carried a number of British and Canadian officials. Considerable efforts were taken to keep her positions a secret, though the still neutral United States continued to publish her arrival and departure times. But by August 23, 1940, the Britannic was once again requisitioned as a troop ship. She sailed multiple voyages to South Africa and India, as well as a number of transatlantic crossings. Her capacity was initially 3,000 troops, but this was later increased to a cramped 5,000. During the war, the Georgic was bombed, burned, and sank during a German bombing raid in Egypt. Despite her extensive damage, the ship was salvaged and eventually returned to service. While her running mate barely survived the war, the Britannic managed to make it through the conflict unscathed. Over the course of the war, the Britannic sailed 324,792 nautical miles and carried 173,550 people. She also played a part in the invasion of Normandy by bringing 20,000 US troops to Europe. The Ministry of War Transport held her in reserve until releasing her back to the Cunard White Star Line in March 1947. She was sent to Harlan and Wolf's Yard in Liverpool, where she would undergo a significant refit to bring her back into passenger service. In 1949, the slow death of the White Star Line was completed when the Cunard Line bought out White Star's share of the business. Starting in 1950, the company would simply be known as the Cunard Line. Despite the change, both the Britannic and the Georgic continued to sail under both house flags and maintained the White Star livery. Britannic was extensively refitted after the war. These refits were a perfect opportunity to make major improvements and modernize the popular liner. The work was slowed by post-war material shortages and cost £1 million to complete. She was converted from a 3 to a 2 class configuration, and her passenger capacity was lowered from 1,553 to 1,049, with 551 in cabin class and 498 in tourist. Many of her cabins were enlarged and equipped with bathrooms, and her interiors were redecorated in an Art Deco style similar to the decor on the Georgic. She was also equipped with new safety features, including a modern fire detection system. These refits increased her tonnage to 27,666. She re-entered service on May 22, 1948, on the Liverpool to New York route, and was welcomed into New York Harbor with a traditional water salute. The Britannic's post-war career was just as successful as her pre-war sailings. She filled around 80% of her capacity on most voyages and even reached 92% on some crossings. The post-war years from the late 1940s through the early 1950s generated significant profits for the Cunard Line and represented the last golden age of ocean travel. But as you no doubt already know, as the 1950s wore on, signs of trouble began to emerge for the company as jet travel took hold at the end of the decade. Despite all this, the Britannic remained popular, and she operated extended cruises from New York to the Mediterranean during the winter months. Her crossings were mostly uneventful, but she did suffer a minor head-on collision with the American cargo ship, the Pioneer Land, in thick fog near the Ambrose Lightship in June 1950, but she avoided major damage in the incident and continued her eastbound crossing. In 1953 and 1955, she suffered minor fires though neither incident resulted in any major damage or injury to her passengers or crew. The Georgic didn't enjoy the same kind of post-war career as her former running mate. The damage she suffered during the war meant that she was not fully restored to her pre-war luxury, and she was used as a utilitarian immigration ship operating between the UK and Australia. She was briefly used as a troop ship in the Korean War, and she was finally withdrawn from service in 1955. This left the MV Britannic the last liner to sail under the White Star Line flag. The once dominant shipping empire was now reduced to a single, moderately sized liner. In her later years, she operated both transatlantic voyages and extended cruises. In 1960, her 1961 schedule was published, but these crossings would never take place. On May 9, 1960, 
the crankshaft on one of her main engines cracked. She was forced to remain in New York until repairs could be made in July, costing the company $40,000 and causing her to miss three more voyages. While she was returned to service, it was soon announced that she would sail her final voyage with Cunard in December of 1960. Her routes would be taken over by the recently launched RMS Sylvania. Her final sailing left New York on November 25, 1960, and arrived in Liverpool on December 3rd. Only a few weeks later, the final White Star Liner was sent for scrapping, which was completed at the end of 1961. The MV Britannic was the last breath of success for the White Star Line as the once great company receded into failure. She was perfectly suited for the time she was launched and proved that even in their final years, the White Star Line was still capable of innovating. Now, the company is mostly known for disaster, a cruel and largely inaccurate stand-in for recklessness and poorly managed ships. But this reputation is far from reality. The White Star Line built and operated some of the most innovative and influential ships to ever sail. More than anything, the company's biggest downfall was a lack of luck that was compounded by financial mismanagement in their final years. Still, if their merger happened only a few years earlier, the White Star Line would probably have emerged as the dominant company, and perhaps would still be sailing today instead of Cunard. But who knows? The MV Britannic proves what the company was capable of a beautiful ship that offered passengers a safe, comfortable, and affordable way to cross the Atlantic. And they loved her for it. Thank you so much for watching. I hope if you liked it, you'll take a second to hit that like button and subscribe if you're one of them lurkers. It helps new people discover these videos, and that helps me keep making them. Also, check out World of Warships. It's a great game and a great way to support this channel. Alright friends, that's all I've got. Until the next one, be nice to people.